Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Congregational Church. Um, please take time to complete the communication and prayer form in your bulletin. And for those of us who are, for those of you who are joining us through the internet, welcome to you. And donations are always appreciated by visiting www.cremuscongregational.org and clicking on the donate button. And thanks to those who provided the treats and flowers today. Please join us for refreshments after the wor worship in the East Room. Does anyone have any announcements today? I have a couple. Um, December 7th, Saturday, uh, the children will be baking Christmas cookies with Debbie Jones. And uh, Tuesday, December 24th, we have the candlelight service at 8 p.m. If there are no other announcements, I expect to begin the Advent reading today. And it's love in my portion of hope today. Today we light the first candle of Advent, the candle of hope. We put our hope in the one to come promised one who comes from God to bring good news of salvation. We hope in the one who will lead us to walk in the light of the Lord. We hope he will not let us live in dark valleys, but on the high mountain of God. We light this candle in hope. On this day, we remember to hopefully look for the coming of Christ. And I would like to announce the covenant choir, and we are going to sing, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel.
see you all here. Let's open with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to together on this Sunday to get together, to hear from your word, to sing praises to your name. And Lord, we ask that you would open our minds and hearts to the message, to uh, your glory that you show through it, and help us to overflow out of our hearts with praise and joy to you. And so then... Jesus Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Please rise and we're going to sing 134, the King of Glory. Since the church candle is Pope, we're going to take a look in a different book for the message today, picking up with all of his adventures in Galatians next time. But this time we're going to read and learn from Isaiah 9, and it's going to be Isaiah 9, 1 through 7. Isaiah 9, 1 through 7. So starting with verse 1. Nevertheless, the gloom will not be upon her. Distressed. And when at first he lightly esteemed the land of Zebulun and the land of the Balti, and afterwards more heavily oppressed her by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, in Galilee of the uh, Gentiles, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them light has shined. You have multiplied the nation and increased its joy. They rejoice before you. According to the joy of harvest, as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For you have broken the yoke of his burden, and the, and the staff on, of his shoulder, and the rod of his oppressor, as in the day of the dam. For every warrior's sandal from the noise of battle, and the garments rolled in blood, will be used for burning and fuel of fire. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and to establish with justice and judgment, from the time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this hope through this message, and Lord, we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would come in and teach us your word, that Lord, you dwell within each believer, and you're there for our, our teaching and edification, and making us more into the likeness of Christ. So Lord, we ask that you would do that, that Lord, you would uh, help us to see how during this season that we look towards the ultimate hope that you gave to humanity so long ago, and even longer before this prophecy was written with. 
And so, Lord, we thank you for it. We pray that we are encouraged, and we pray that we will uh, be left in a state of awe at your grace and kindness. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So to start, and always kind of a good habit to uh, looking at a passage of Scripture, we're going to take a little, just a short little backtrack and see what's happening uh, in the book of Isaiah up to this point, specifically what's happening in chapter 8 before um, Zero Ephronite's War. Didn't think to hear that in a first Christmas sermon, did you? But this is what's happening at the time. So Israel and Syria have been harassing and attacking Judah. Uh, and what is going to happen is God is going to end up judging the two. Uh, the enemies, the Assyrians, are gaining strength and starting to take land. And Judah is being pressed into... Uh, helping there. And Israel's still standing, but it will soon fall. And so up to this point, we have to ask, what's happened to Israel that's got us in this, this kind of point? Uh, they failed to live up to the calling that God has called them to. God told them to be a holy and separate nation, uh, that he is going to reveal himself through. However, they have gone astray. Ahaz and the rest of the, the kingdom, Ahaz is the king of the moment, uh, have characterized by the lack of faith. The priests and the prophets are spiritual and literal drunks. The princes are horrible sinners, and there are scoffers and skeptics thinking that the judgment that's about to come upon them, that they will escape. Overall, Israel has set themselves up and against God, and this can only end in disaster. And so, with verse 8 ending in this impending doom, the next verse you would think that keep on moving, but what we have in the next verse is hope. And this is the hope that is uh, found in the child that will be given. And so instead of a corrupt leader, this child is going to be a righteous ruler. He'll be from the tribe of Jesse, from the house of David, and he'll be everything that his forefathers have failed to be. His kingdom will be free from war and oppression, and his kingdom will have no end. He's given special titles like Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. This era will be the time of the Messiah and the promised future king. So let's look at verse 1. It says, Nevertheless, the gloom will not be upon her who is distressed, as when at first he lightly esteemed the land of Zebulun and the land of Nabalti. And afterwards, more heavily oppressed her by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan and Galilee of the Gentiles. So we first start off, and these people, again, are in and expecting doom and gloom to come, but there's going to be a time when that's going to be no more. And we kind of, at least this has always given me pause when I go through and hear Christmas sermons and, and hear these Old Testament prophecies, what does the land of Zebulun and Nabalti had to do with this whole entire thing. Well, these two lands were heavily oppressed by military might, and out of them, surprisingly, Isaiah says that there's going to come from these oppressed areas a light, a light of hope. If you look at Matthew 4, we see how this land of hope comes about. Jesus springs and does his ministry in this area of Galilee. And verse 2 goes on to say, People who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in the land of shadow of death, upon them light has shined. And notice the tense in these verses. Tense is in the past tense. So Isaiah is speaking and kind of has a vision of these things that have already happened. These people have already seen a great light. And when we look at prophecy in the Bible, it's as good as done. It's God who wills it, and it's God who is set up. So not only does um, Isaiah see this as done, but um, he is giving hope to the people that this is something that God will do. Kelvin states, this is a quote from him, says, Therefore, to be summed up in this manner, 
Even in darkness, nay, in death itself, there is nevertheless good ground for hope. For the power of God is sufficient to restore life to his people when they appear to be already dead. Matthew, who quotes this passage, appears to torture it to a different meaning. For he says that this prediction was fulfilled when Christ preached along the sea coast. Again, Matthew 4, 16 is the point where he's talking about. It says, but if we take this view of comparison, then we found that Matthew has applied this passage to Christ correctly and to its true meaning. So again, we look at what Christ did. His ministry in Galilee, and he was a true light to these people. These people were in gloom, beaten down by spiritual destruction and physical ailment. But Jesus came through and gave them hope. He gave them deliverance from their sickness and death. And he taught, and his miracles authenticated his message that the kingdom of God was breaking into reality at this very moment. With the dawning of Christ's ministry, we have the kingdom of God that's being promised here already starting to take place. And it says, verse 3, You multiply the nations and increase its joy. They rejoice before you according to the joy of harvest, as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. So Isaiah turns to God at this point. He's addressing this this reaction that his hope is going to bring. The people at this time have a happiness that is exceptionally joyous. Isaiah describes it as a bountiful harvest. Again, this is a kind of farming society, so you think about planting all your crops and you've got so much goodies at the end that all your storehouses are, are full, breaking over pouring out. So this is the, the joy someone would have. Or, after a battle, he points to people. After they've won, and they throw all the, the spoil in a big pile, and they start divvying out the loot, it's kind of like, oh boy, now I get, to, I get to have what I'm, I got coming towards me. So there's that kind of joy and expectation that is characterized by this messianic age. And he says, for you have broken the yoke of his burden, the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his suppressor, as in the day of the dam. For every warrior's sandal from noisy battle, and garments rolled in blood, will be used for burning and fuel of fire. So God himself is going to be the one who brings us about. And they say, how? Well, he points to the day of the dam when uh, Gideon is aided by the Lord, and the battle is won because of the Lord. So this is something that God does. And it is power and sure of happening because God is the one that's doing it. So once again, he will show that he is the sole author of salvation for his people. And so the first five verses that we've gone through here talk about what to expect in the Messianic age. It's a time of great joy, abundance, there's no war, there's no more pain or anything like that. And in the last two verses, we get to see who exactly is going to bring this about. Because all this seems pretty grand. And all the the kings at the time would promise the kind of things that that this is being promised. So who is God going to send that is going to be able to bring this about? He's going uh, going to send a baby. This run to us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulder. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And so who is this child? Some of the past, and many Jews over the years have said it was Hezekiah. However, despite Hezekiah being uh, trustworthy, or learning that God is trustworthy, that he's not the one to view. Chapters 38 and 39 solidify this fact. Remember, Hezekiah is the one that gets sick and goes to the Lord and the Lord gives him 15 more years of life. But he dies. And so his rule dies with him too. So this can't be the everlasting king with some in mind. And additionally, Hezekiah has his own foibles and he goes and shows off his wealth and trust and his own self-sufficiency. So this isn't the king that we're talking about. This child 
is not only born, but a child of God. But this is a son that's also given. John 3, 16 and 1 John 4, 9. Talk of Jesus being given. The son is given, and the son will have the government upon his shoulders, showing that he holds and rules over everything. And he's given the titles, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. At the time, kings were often given a slew of names attached to them. You usually get about five names if you're a king. You know, um, Jenny the Bold, Strong, Black Haired, um, Mighty, yeah, all that kind of all that kind of good stuff. <laughs> the ones that are thinking about in my mind, the other kings would, I mean, they're called like Jenny the Bold or something like that. That's Anyways, it would, it would describe and kind of exalt the person's character. However, the titles that we get for this son who's about to be born is something much more awe-inspiring. First one, Wonderful Counselor. I don't know what translation we're all using out there. Uh, in my Bible, it separates them, but the Hebrew is it's put together. So the type of counselor is the wonderful one. So if you have a Bible that puts them forth, or puts a little comment in there. Um, that's what's happening. I have to do King James up here, so it might be a King James type stream. But the counselor that's coming is a wonderful one. This is the type of counselor that's going to be. And this isn't just wonderful as in he's a really good counselor. That he can really hear your problems really well. The, the type of wonderful that we're talking about is one that's associated with the supernatural. That kind of wonderful. So we hear of, of David when he is uh, commenting on God's knowledge. And he says, Oh Lord, your, your knowledge is too wonderful for me to, to comprehend. That it is so grand and divine that it's beyond his comprehension. This is the kind of wonderful the counselor is going to be. And so we look at, again, Christ. Christ has this absolute wisdom. He proceeds. As it, and as he proceeds from the Father. The Father gets the Son, and the Son reveals the Father, who he himself chooses to. And the Son reveals the awesome knowledge of God, because he is God himself. So the counselor we have is nonetheless than God himself, which goes into our next title, the Mighty God. Pretty self-explanatory. How is the Messiah going to accomplish all this everlasting peace? It's because the Messiah is nonetheless than God himself. In our opening um, song, the choir song, uh, Emmanuel, God with us, the name being God with us, and also in Isaiah seven fourteen, it talks about the Son being called Emmanuel, and this is pointing to who the Son is. It is God Himself coming down into His creation in the form of a child. It kind of goes to that awe. Inspiring, wonderful knowledge of God when one thinks about that. Everlasting Father. This can be a tricky one. Father is, is used in this sense. And in, in 2 Samuel 7 14, that's where we talk about the covenant that God makes with David. At the time, God says, You're always going to have a person in your family on the throne. And God will be a father to that king. The king will be like a son. So why is Father being used in this sense. And so this isn't to confuse the persons of the Trinity, the Father and the Son, but to point out that God, who has sovereignly put each Davidic king on his throne, is now coming and taking the throne for himself. That he is the Son, but he is also sovereign and has placed himself on the throne. Jesus himself states that he comes in his Father's name, and that he and the Father are one, and that they are distinct, but they are united as one. One God. One God. And then finally, Prince of Peace. One commentator helpfully points out that the Hebrew concept of peace is not only has to do with the absence of war, we see that throwing the sandals, burning all their equipment and war and stuff like that, but it, it has to do with the ability to live out 
one's life undisturbed, just thinking all the things that you could do if your life was not filled with disturbances. That'd be pretty nice. Pretty nice. So how is this going to happen? Again, it's God who brings it about. When Christ came, he brought with him peace and reconciliation with God through the death and resurrection. Yet he also states in other passages that he does not come to bring peace but a sword. So John 10, 34 says this. And so this is because, again, of the nature of the kingdom of God. It breaks in slowly. All the parables that Jesus talked about, how the kingdom of God is like leaven going through the bread, and it kind of rises up. And it starts, and it builds and goes all the way through the bread. So to the kingdom. So at this time, we still have trouble and wars, rumor of wars, and everything like that. But in the future, and this is the, the tricky part, with the Messiah, the first time he comes, he does away with sin, the guilt of it, reconciles with God. The second time is when this perfect government is ushered in and brought about. So Christ comes first to deal with sin. His second coming brings swift judgment to his enemies and fully ushers in this messianic, peaceful era. An era where there is new heavens and new earth by which such peace can be successfully lived out. And then finally, verse 7. Of the increase of the, his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order and to establish it with the judgment and justice from that time forward, forever and ever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So this peace will never end. It will really, truly never end. And it will happen because it's God in his zeal to see that his people are saved and that his creation is renewed, is driving this whole thing forward. That God is zealous to see this happen. And so from this piece of scripture. In the midst of judgment, God gave his people then and now for us to hope. Instead of trusting in military might and alliance at the time, Judah was called to trust God. Now we know how that ended up. We know that both ended up in exile. But yet, this promise was still given for the hope of God's people. That despite the current gloom of judgment and for sin, God himself would line up his people bring them into peace. So even despite the judgment, this hope is still given to them, that God will still bring them back and will finally deal with their iniquity, their sin, and their hurt. And so we take special time this year, this season, to celebrate the incarnation, that is, God coming incarnate in flesh to be with us, our Emmanuel. And from Isaiah's prophecy, which took place many years before Christ's birth, we can still gather application that brings us hope, to get us through the rest of this year, and into the next, and into eternity. So what are these ways? Quickly, my main thing I want us to take away from is that hope will never be a hope that will never fail us. It's only found in Jesus Christ, who is our wonderful counselor, the mighty God, everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. This is where true hope comes from. First, that our wonderful counselor gives us hope for the present and the future. God's knowledge is limitless, and he knows the beginning from the end. And when the Bible instructs us in the way that we go, we can be sure that we are given the best course of action. Most of the time we do act like Judah. And we are called to trust God, but yet we don't, and we are reprimanded. But us, despite the reprimand, being in Christ, we know that punishment and instruction on us is not to our doom. It's not to our destruction. Instead, God uses this temporal type punishment to actually bring about Christ in us. It's further to develop likeness of Christ in us. 
And because we have security in Christ, and we know that everything that happens to us works out for good for those who love Christ Jesus, that we can live boldly for Christ today. We need not fear who, again, coming up next year, we're going to have a whole slew of campaign ads, and that'll be, that'll be fun. Um, but we don't have to fear who is in office, who is in government. Uh, we don't have to place our hope in the transitory things of the world. Now, this isn't a call to inaction. Last um, Tuesday in Bible study, we were talking about um, what we are to be as, as Christians and how we interact with society that you know we don't want to go full separatist and pull away from everything. We have to still be engaged uh, and influence the culture. But in the process of that, we can be secure, and we have hope that despite what happens, that God is still for us, and what we have in Christ is ours and can't be taken away. So Christians shouldn't be tossed and turned by the shifting events of the world. And if you are, I encourage you to study and to pray more so that you can understand your Savior more. With the knowledge of the Savior and with walking with Him in the Spirit, you will have that peace and joy that He says that so abundantly to his children. Two, the mighty God and everlasting Father secures our hope. So God himself, who is everlasting to everlasting, is the one who is securing this peace that is coming. The God himself in his power is going to accomplish that. Through his Son, we can experience a taste of this new era that's about to come in the future. We can be empowered by the Holy Spirit to live for God for today. We can taste the joy that is to come by knowing God through Jesus Christ. And this will only be improved upon when we pass into the eternal kingdom. So we're getting a head start on heaven now. We can have that joy that's in Christ. That doesn't mean we won't have our ups and downs. But the surpassing joy and sustaining joy will always be ours. Just as Isaiah promised, prophesied that God is uh, his prophecy is as good as done so too does Jesus himself say that he himself is coming back for his church is as good as done too so there is something that is more sure than death and taxes as they say and that's the second coming of Christ so he is coming back for his church our savior and our powerful God will do as he and point three, final point. The hope for peace is only through the Prince of Peace. Till the return of Christ, there will always be injustice and corruption. And don't think that any fast-talking politician, technological advance, or governmental safety net is something to place your final hope in. Again, we can use these things. But this isn't something that should take away, shake us to our core. We have to have our core firmly planted in Christ. And apart from Christ, all these other things, which could go away, and they will go away someday, we will be left with either Christ or nothing. So use what God has given us now to bring glory to his name. And don't be fearful, for God will take care of you. Peace is yours in Christ. And there will be a time in eternity when this life and all its troubles will seem microscopic in comparison when faced with the everlasting joy and peace of heaven. However, as a warning as always, outside of Christ there is no peace. Only lingering wrath of God's judgment and eternity of pain and anguish, the exact opposite of what those have in Christ. Whether we have eternal bliss and eternal happiness, the opposite is eternal pain and anguish. God's justice will even be met out toward or met out towards our sin on the cross, on his son, or by you in hell. As hope is realized and confirmed as one steps into eternity in heaven, hope is the first thing taken away after being thrown and sliding down the bank into the lake of fire. Merry Christmas. <laughs> we just keep it there. No. But that is the thing, that's the horrible realization that apart from Christ there is no peace. And so, 
as the Holy Spirit said to the Israelites, to the past, and in the book of Hebrews, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Turn to Christ. He has done the work, and he calls you to rest and to serve in him. So there is that. Nobody is excluded. You can be poor, you can be rich, you can be super smart, or you can be not super smart. It doesn't matter. Everybody is called to take part in the joy and peace of Christ. So trust in Christ, and he is the only way to everlasting peace. He will not leave you, he will not forsake you. And he will go with you through life's troubles and give you rest and eternity. And so this is again what we celebrate this season. Our Savior. He provides hope that, unlike this candle, will never be extinguished. Pray with me, please. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the hope that is in your Son, Christ. That, Lord, despite the troubles that we go through in our lives on a daily basis, we know that, above all, that you control and direct these things. And that this is all done for our good. That's not to say that the that we should joy if somebody spits in our face or something like that and all that. But we know that there's a time when that we will be vindicated by trusting in you, and that we will be free from death and sin and all that nasty stuff that's in our life here, Lord. And that we will have eternity in bliss beyond imagining, that we can't even imagine the kind of bliss and hope and, and joy realized that we'll have in heaven. So Lord, we eagerly await that day. We pray that you would return soon, and that we, as people who follow you, are here on earth, would seek to please you and bring glory to your name as our lives run their course here on earth. And so, Lord, we thank you and we pray in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. So with that, can we have our ushers come forward and we will take this morning off.
pray that we would be good stewards of this wealth that you've given us, that we would further the church and we would further um, the message that reaches out to people and tell them that you are the Prince of Peace. So we thank you and we pray in Christ's name. Sunday of the month, which is great, because we have communion of love. So, we have in the back of your hymnals the Salem Church Covenant, which we will say before we partake. Um, and so, we'll start. We covenant with the Lord and one with another, and do bind ourselves in the presence of God to walk together in all his ways, as according as he is pleased to reveal himself unto us. In his blessed word of truth. And again, as we always say, that word of truth, that blessed word of truth is the Bible. That is our highest rule of authority when it comes to faith and practice. And in that book of faith and practice, we learn about the supper that Jesus instituted with his disciples. That on the night, on the night that he is betrayed and given over, that he with his disciples, has a Passover meal. He has the bread broken, which is his body, and the wine poured, which is the blood that's shed for us. And that is because Christ is our substitute. He's saying, instead of you dying for your sins, I am dying for your sins. That I am your substitute. And through the substitution, we have God's wrath against sin satisfied. And the fun word that's being phased out of the Bible, but it's still a cold world. Propitiation. God is propitiatory or propitiated towards us, meaning that He is now in a favorable light towards us, that the wrath is passed forward. And Christ, or as and the Father now sees us as He sees His Son Christ, because we are covered in His righteousness. And so with that, as we approach the table, we know that our own righteousness is not the reason we're coming to this table, that it's Christ's righteousness that brings us. And so, before we partake, we'll have a silent prayer, and we'll lead us in a public-type uh, confession. But then we will partake of the elements, and then go from there. So, pray with me, please. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your son. Lord, I thank you that you have given your son. The son was born and gives us hope. Lord, without your son, we wouldn't have hope. But Lord, we do have your son, so we have hope. And we will have that hope realized in abundance. And so Lord, as we take the time out this Sunday, Lord, we, we know that because we wouldn't have had hope without your son, it's because we have sin in us. The Lord, sin separates us from you because you are a holy and just God. But instead of leaving us to our punishment, which we've been deserved, you sent your Son to take our place and cleanse us from all of our sins and unrighteousness. And like a cloak or a cape, Lord, Christ has taken his righteousness and put it over our shoulders. That our righteousness comes from Christ. And so, Lord, we, we thank you and we rejoice now, Lord. Knowing that our sins are dealt with, that they are a thing of the past, and we are new creations which are zealous for doing good works for you. Not out of compulsion, but out of thanksgiving, and out of the new nature that you created us to be. So with this time, help this to be a celebration, Lord, and a remembrance of what you've done for us so many years ago. Something that will continue to eternity and give us joy there. So we thank you and pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Let us first distribute the bread and we will sing our communion hymn. That communion hymn. 
Shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin, meaning that sin brings with it death. But through Christ's death and his resurrection, we have life. So with this cup, we may pray. celebrating Advent when Jesus is born, but in our story, he's already grown up, died, and came back to life. So, it's all good. It's all good. So, last time we remember that Jesus came back and all the disciples were freaking out because, well, he came back. People don't do that very often. And so, Jesus was eating and showing them, hey, I'm still flesh. Speaking of flesh, we got a cool, we got a cool tattoo up here. Just get out of the pen. We haven't seen you in a while. She's got a cool frozen. Is that what that is? Oh, 
very cool. My mom won't let me get tattoos. Your mom's cool. My mom's cool too. But. Anyways, enough about our moms. This call is Jesus taking us to uh, taking to heaven. It's from Mark, Luke, and Acts. Lots of them. Yeah. Jesus stayed with the eleven apostles for forty days. He spoke with them about God's kingdom. One day, he said, Don't leave Jerusalem yet. Wait here. John baptized people with water, but soon you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And he's talking to them. Talking to them on the steps. That's a hard look at that picture. <laughs> A few days later, uh, one of the apostles asked him, Lord, are you not going to give Israel its own king again? Jesus said that they did not need to know what God had planned or when the events would happen. But the Holy Spirit will come upon you and give you power, he told his faithful friends. Then you will tell everyone about me, people in Jerusalem and all of Judea and in Samaria and everywhere in the world. Now he's teaching us some more. Yeah, they're all around that table. That's kind of like what the Last Supper table would look like. They're kind of doing the Japanese thing where they all sit on the pillows on the floor. After Jesus had said this, a cloud appeared over their heads. Then, right before their eyes, Jesus was taken up into the cloud. The apostles could not see him, but they kept looking up at the sky. As the cloud rose higher and higher, Suddenly, two men dressed in white clothes were standing beside them. And they said to the apostles, Jesus has been taken to heaven, but he will come back in the same way that you have seen him go. There's two, two angels. They look like Kathy Griffin, don't they? You know, she's, that's probably the best. That's the end of our story. So Jesus is taken up. Yes? That was, yeah, was pretty short. I thought it was going to be longer, but I guess I was flipping over there. So Jesus, after coming back and after being with his disciples for some time and showing everybody that he's back, he goes up to heaven. But, you know what the important thing is that he was talking about? One of the many important things is that he's going to send this Holy Spirit that is going to live in us. So the Holy Spirit is not some kind of force or impersonal thing, but it is actually a person, just like Jesus is a person. And he is sent to live inside each Christian. And this Holy Spirit, God himself, helps us to live out the lives that God's called us to do. So a lot of times, you know, we read the Bible and it says, do this and do that, and we think, oh, do I have to do this because this will make my God like me? Well, no. God accepts you because he accepts his son's sacrifice. And when we place our trust in Christ, we're joined to him. And then, we're made new. But we still need help how to live out that life. So that's what the Holy Spirit does. He slowly changes us to be more and more like Christ. So we have to yield to what he says. We read that in the Bible and his leadings. You'll lead us through a life of pleasing to God. Out of joy of what God has done for us. And, secondly, just as Christ went up into the clouds, he's coming back someday. And who is he coming back? You read the book of Revelation, he is coming back something fierce. But, something to look forward to. And something that is ultimately joyous for us who are in Christ. Maybe not for the unbelievers, especially not for the unbelievers, but until that, we can bring the hope that they can escape that judgment by telling them who Christ is and what he's done for us. So hopefully, they'll turn to him. Right? Yes. It's very good. All right. Thanks for coming up here. Good to see you. She was up here. She was, I don't know, I'm not walking that well. Oh, you remember. You remember when I didn't remember. Ethan's going to go around and get a prayer request. And we're going to sing verses 
1 and 3 of 619. God will take care of you. Heavenly Father, we know that you will take care of us, and Lord, you said that, that if we ask and we seek, that we will find, that Lord, we know how to good, good, give good gifts to our children, and we who are polluted by sin, if we know how to do that, that so much more you who are perfect and our Heavenly and Holy Father will be able to give to us. Lord, we know that there is no resources that you draw from. Lord, you provide all and sustain all and is in all. So, Lord, we know that when we come to you, abundance is waiting for us. So, Lord, we come and ask that your abundance would overflow, that it would overflow and, and heal our sickness, that it would give us the strength to go throughout different relationships that we might be struggling with, whatever it has we have on our plates, Lord. We know that your strength and grace is sufficient to tackle it. And so, Lord, help us to do this, giving glory to your name, in the name of Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let us sing our praise hymn. That praise hymn being Emmanuel, Emmanuel. We have a theme today here. It's going to be found on 140.
And Lord, as we go throughout these church door buildings, Lord, bless us. Bless this week. Bless this, our actions that we do. And may they bring glory to your Son, who is enthroned of all, all else, to whose name is glory and honor forever and ever. Praying in his name. Amen.